it's very important to have an anchor just so that you don't drift throughout the day and also just to come back to because um, a lot of times you'll be sitting in the grade and I'm kind of used to working long days in the room but with somebody that might not necessarily be that used to it you know you could grade yourself into a corner and then you're like oh my god what have we done you know Hi, today I'm in Los Angeles in the neighborhood of Los Feliz, and we're outside of Breakwater Studios. In here works Steven Delugian, who is a colorist here, and we're going to be talking to him about his craft as a colorist and his approach to grading. Breakwater Studios specializes in short-form documentaries, and they've even won an Oscar for one of them. So follow along. So where are we today? Um, you're at Breakwater Studios, home of the short doc. My name is Steven Derluji and I'm the colorist in residence here. Welcome. So Breakwater Studios is um, a short form production company founded by Brent Poutfoot, uh, I think in 2011. Uh, I've been here since the beginning uh, in various capacities, but right now I'm a colorist. And um, yeah, we've made something over 60 short docs in that time. And I run my business out of here. I'm, I'm a colorist and I have a color suite in the back of the building. How do you like this area for like post-production? Uh, Lost Fields is a super dynamic, uh, creative, kind of hipster area. Um, very often I'll just be walking down the street here to grab lunch or something and I'll see like five or six different clients. Uh -huh. Especially there's like a really trendy space uh, around the block called Go Get 'em Tiger where there's constantly some kind of like trendy power lunch happening and I see like all my clients there okay, um, nice. or at home state. So cool neighborhood uh, across the street. Uh, downstairs from our original office is the place where Walt Disney first drew Mickey Mouse in the early 1920s. Wow. So, a lot of history here. Roy and Walt Disney used to live down the street, um, and it's like a really cool old Hollywood neighborhood. Charlie Chaplin Studios down the street. I think it, now it's YouTube. Don't quote me on that. This is the color suite here. Um, so you have your clients in front of you here working. Yeah. Is that like your preferred way of working, like to communicate with them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've had a number of color suites over the years, and I've had the, like the, the sort of standard Company 3 setup before where the monitor might be over here or just off to the side. And um, the reason I did that more is just to control the space psychologically. Um, like a lot of times, like I work very, very hard with um, uh, Dave Abrams is at Avocal. He's my yeah. calibrator. Really cool guy. Um, you know, we might have a... WRGB OLED here and a different type of OLED over there, but the match between the two monitors is virtually impossible to yeah. get perfect. Mm. And so having the two monitors directly side by side is just asking for trouble. Yeah. So that's honestly my biggest reason, but also just to break up the space psychologically where it's like, this is my space, you know, yeah, I, I'm not like persnickety about it. People are welcome to come back here, but you know, just focus on the monitor as if it were like a theatrical experience yeah. or like you're at home, like on your couch, you know. Just enjoying the, yeah. enjoying the yeah. film, okay. Yeah. You have an amazing collection of posters here. How did that come about? So, uh, you know, we built this color suite. It's a very sort of awkward space because it's 16 and a half feet. It's not like you're going to split it in half. Um, and the footprint is, is rather large. So we put these large bookshelves on this side of the wall. But, you know, you're staring at this vast expanse and, and uh, what are you going to fill it with? And um, I sort of came up with the idea of doing like an old picture wall. And uh, a lot of these posters are originals from some of my favorite movies growing up. Um, and you can get originals still of a lot of these really cool movies. Uh, you know, like this is uh, Ivan's Childhood by Tarkovsky. Uh, I think it's one of his most underrated movies. Um, 
you know, uh, Indiana Jones you can get an original from, you know. Uh, this is a cool one, um, A Warm Peace uh, by Sergei Bondarchuk. It's quite possibly uh, one of the most expensive movies ever made. It's cool to have like a piece of film history. I also really like the poster. Uh, it's a French poster. It's a very beautiful, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still working on the, uh, what particular posters are going in here. Um, they're not all originals, but um, when something cool comes up on eBay, I'll snatch it. You know? You're a freelancer now. Did you start out working at a bigger firm or? No, I've never worked at a color house. Uh, I've worked with people from color houses quite a bit, but I never worked at Company 3 or The Mill. I never worked in the machine room. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I learned is either from people that work there yeah. or just on my own or uh, through trial and error and stuff like that. Cool. Do you yeah. think that's like a good uh, approach you would recommend to other people? I don't know. Everyone's path is different. So uh, I think there's some people that would benefit from that environment. I also know people that probably wouldn't. For me, there really isn't, wasn't any other choice yeah. because um, I kind of just fell into color correction and uh, I feel people that, you know, someone like Brian Smaller, I know, like he, he um, started working at Company 3 Chicago when he was 17, mm. you know, so that's somebody that really wants to know that there was a colorist. I kind of fell into this, yeah. so it's a bit different for me. Okay, like the clients that you have not, uh, at the moment, like yeah. how did you how did you build up those relationships and meet them? A lot of my business is very organic. I don't have like a marketing scheme or anything. Uh, I would say ninety percent of it is word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, someone comes to you. You try to do the best job you can given their budget, and it just sort of spreads naturally that way. Sure. A lot of other independent colorists I know and talk to they'll use like a marketing approach where they'll have like 50,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. But honestly, the best quality cli clients, the best people that I interact with have not been off of Instagram. Okay. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have any aspirations to do that. I, I, I'm somebody that values face-to-face -face time quite yeah. a bit. I don't, you know, as much as I love Pixel View, there's nothing beats working with someone in the same room at the same time, making creative decisions in real time. You yeah. Know? So. Are the people still coming in here even after COVID? Have they have it started to like come back the foot traffic? Sadly, I think there has been like a little paradigm shift, and a lot of people do want to re work remote. Uh, they expect that a lot of DPs, especially because yeah, DPs work a lot, um, they'll be on set. They have to work on a project. You know, a lot of people don't get paid to color exactly, DPs, yeah. so um, you know sometimes you have to work with it. Uh, but even still, uh, whenever there's an opportunity, I tell people to come in mm. because there's so much that is very hard to articulate about a uh, DP colorist relationship yeah. where if I work with someone for a day, I can sort of get a feel for what they want. Sure. You know, uh, it's very difficult to talk about color. Yeah. There, are, there are only certain, I don't know about Swedish, in, in English, there's not a lot of words for color, you know, saturated, whatever. Mm. And you sort of get a feel for what someone actually means when they give you a direction. Yeah. Because a lot you know. of people don't know the lingo either. Like they don't, they might not know like what saturation is and color and the contrast and yeah. yeah. And he, but even still, even yeah. if they do know, yeah. uh, they might not know what they actually want. Yeah. And it takes a while to just work through yeah. various possibilities. Um, yesterday, I was on a remote grade with a creative director, and she kept giving a note about vibrancy, and I was you know like tinkering with saturation all over the image, and it and it turned out that it was a framing issue. You know, like she wanted to see more of the the background, uh -huh. the backdrop, you know, and there, you know, that's not up to me. <laughs> so I wasn't able to incorporate that note, but you know, it's this, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Yeah. You know. And how do you usually start a project to find that sort of um, the feeling that they're going for? Like, do you prepare like different looks or like how's uh, the process? I love to work off of references. I know a lot of colorists don't like that because they feel pigeonholed, but I like to, you know, pull in like your favorite. Reference images could be painting, could be uh, stills from a movie you like. Mm -hmm. I really like that because, especially with people that aren't used to coloring, mm -hmm. it's very important to have an anchor mm -hmm. just so that you don't drift throughout the day and also just to come back to. Because yeah. um, a lot of times you'll be sitting in the grade and I'm kind of used to working long days in the room, but with somebody that might not necessarily be that used to it, yeah. you know, you could grade yourself into a corner and then you're like, oh my God, what have we done, you know? And, yeah. uh, and a lot of people forget that this is where we started from. You know, they'll bring in like a reference from a really green movie, um, like a horror movie, 
And then they'll be like, do you think we're too green? You know, and you have to pull in the reference to, to show them that, you know, we are quite green, but that's what you wanted. Mm. And then maybe if they figure out that it's not what they want, yeah. you know. Um, so uh, I think references are really good because it, it, it sort of grounds you psychologically. Yeah, and you can always return to that during the day as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I know even for myself, if I'm working a really long day in the chair, I'll be doing like 12, 14 hours. I'll pull a reference for some stills that I did earlier in the day just so that I know as my eyes get really tired. I don't do this anymore unless I have to, but uh, I'll just come back to those stills that I knew that I set when I was good. And because I can match any time of day, but when I'm making like, it's always good to have fresh eyes when you're setting a look, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Do you take like, like deliberate breaks during the day to go outside or like? like I probably should, yeah. I should probably take more breaks. Uh, no, no, I, I, uh, I should You're do confident that enough to just keep, keep at it, yeah. Well, a lot of times the, 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 the deadlines are so difficult, mm. you know, that you got to turn around these projects so fast mm. that with a client, I think it helps more when I'm working with a client in a room to take some breaks, more for them. But for me, it's kind of, I'll just be in the chair. Um, sometimes I'll eat at my desk. <laughs> it's not great. It's not great. Yeah. Is LA worth living in uh, for you as a callers? Like, does it, does it massively improve your like, job, for example? Yeah. Uh, something I think about a lot. You, yeah, I think I've worked with a lot of people who don't live in L.A. And I think it just makes everything way more difficult. You have to be way more proactive mm -hmm. about meeting people, mm -hmm. about networking, about going to events, being on, on boards, messaging boards, about um, uh, all that sort of stuff. I don't, I think the way that I've sort of built my client base probably wouldn't work. Yeah in a place like Austin or even smaller. It's kind of word, word, word of mouth. I mean, I'd probably become like the guy there, yeah. you know, but in Los Angeles, it's kind of, you're just walking down the street, you meet someone, you're a colorist, they're interested, like maybe you'll collaborate, maybe yeah. you won't. Um, it's sort of a huge hub. Yeah. Also, LA is a, like a, especially for freelancers, is a very vicious market. Mm. Like if you're not doing good work, you're just not gonna get the phone call, you know? Oh, yeah. um, I know, you know, for colorists, it's pretty bad, but like for cinematographers, because everyone wants to be a cinematographer, it's just like, you know, feast or famine, yeah, it's you know, very saturated, very, saturated, yeah. very difficult market. Yeah. So I think in some ways it could be really good. You know, if you're one of those people that doesn't mind putting in 18 hour days, that doesn't mind uh, hustling all day, every day, uh, could be great. But if you're somebody that you know, wants a more balanced lifestyle. Maybe LA isn't, you know, no. maybe you don't want to be holding down a $3,000 apartment a month <laughs> while you're trying to become a cinematographer, yeah. you know, or like, you know. Yeah, I guess a lot of people like start out here and then they sort of move to another place once they have uh, yeah. like a network and, and have some have some jobs maybe, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think LA is a great place to, to develop a skill set. Mm. Like go work for Company 3, figure out how they do stuff, you know, because, um, you know, if you're not forced to confront certain things, then maybe you'll have a lot of, um, you know, weak spots in your in, in your skill set. You know, yeah. if you're work used to working a certain way, you know, I'll work with people from not from L.A., New York, or whatever, and sometimes it's kind of like the workflow maybe isn't as good. You know, they're not as rigorous. Mm. You know, whereas here things are very like profit oriented, very fast, yeah. very, you know, like there's, I don't really have a lot of rooms to make mistakes. You got to deliver. Like, you got to deliver. Yeah. yeah. How is it like on the commercials? Is it very much like agency driven here in, instead of the, the yeah. director or how? Um, yeah, for, for commercials, you know, um, I could have anywhere from one to seven people in here, which can be problematic, you know, cause I can't fit that many, but yeah, agencies will have so many people come in. Um, and I oftentimes don't even know who they are. Yeah. You know, it, it, it could be the director, DP, creative director, producer. I often don't know who they are, you know, a and lot of opinions a world. lot of opinions. And that's like a big, uh, thing where I'm just trying to sort out, uh, who has the power in the room. And sometimes, uh, it happens that the agency will send five people, none of whom really have any power over the decision making process. Mm -hmm. And the person that does is in a meeting because they're too busy, you know? So I'm just trying to like figure out what, what can we do today to lock this project. Yeah. Um, so yeah, agency work is, is, can be difficult, mm. but 
I'm just trying to most of the time figure out how to make everyone happy. Yeah, how do you sort of uh, merge all those different like ideas into the look? Like, do you have any? Have you experienced any like situations that taught you how to like with different opinions in the room, for example? Like... Yeah, I mean, sometimes you can't win. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've tried to become very good at recognizing situations beforehand where I, I will be put in a position where I can't succeed mm -hmm. and avoiding them. Uh, I've gotten really good at uh, someone will send you an email, hey, we need such and such color, you know, and I'll ask them some questions about, you know, like, can I see a rough cut? Do you have any idea about where it needs to go? Do you have any references? Have you thought mm -hmm. about color before you hit record on mm -hmm. the camera, for example? Yeah. Which a lot of people, when you ask them that question, they kind of go, you know, which is fine, but like, you know, I, you just sort of get a sense of who's who's in charge here. Mm -hmm. What are we What are we doing? You know, like these are very basic things that, if like from a simple phone call, you can start to suss out very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, do you do a lot of like passion projects as well, like for for like no money or something, or how do you keep like your your own creative vision like alive or like inspired? Because you're doing like five days a week, yeah. a lot of long hours. Yeah. How do you keep that keep that keep the good creative flowing? Sort of. Um. I don't know if my creativity depends on that. I, I'm mm. just, I really do view myself as like a craftsman. Okay. I'm not, you know, I, I don't have any illusions about being like an artist. You know, I do creative things, but I'm not, you know, I'm here to do a job. Uh, my job is to figure out what the people want. Mm. Sometimes maybe people don't have the clearest vision of what they want, in which case it's kind of my job to, to help steer that. I definitely have things that I gravitate towards, like I like a film look. I like saturation, um, you know, so if you're coming to me for like, I call it the Vimeo staff pick look, like where it's like super desaturated and like really low key vibes, I'll do it, but I'm not your guy. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sh shepherd you that way. I'm curious, like when you start creating something, yeah. do you, are you very, like very fast uh, the first pass or are you like doing the windows and the keys and everything from the start or like, how do you, how do you like to work? Uh, I will do like laps on a on a on a movie where I will go as fast as possible. I'll put a lot on, and then I'll just balance the whole movie. Mm. And then I'll do a pass where I'll just do. I like to work my way from uh, luma saturation and then hue. Mm. So um, I'll balance everything like luma, you know, and then I'll do some saturation work globally, but usually very little. You don't need to. And then I'll do like some hue stuff. And then after the movie is just watchable with a lot on it mm. I'll start going in and then I'll, I'll work my way through masks okay. where I'll do like you know and then basically that way um, I mean if someone wants a really complicated look mm. where you're doing like keying the skin doing outside inside obviously mm. you can't do that workflow mm. um, but generally speaking I will work in laps because that way if someone ever like is like we're done we got to deliver like export now you will have something yeah. to export Whereas if you do like this meticulous grade and you got to finish, you You've know. You've only done like 50% of the film. Yeah. yeah. And also it, uh, the review process, yeah. like you can start sending people export links, you know, after it's just balanced with the lot on it, you know, so they you can start, start setting to... it up immediately when you have something. Or... Yeah. I think, I think, uh, get as much feedback as early as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's why I love to have people in, in the room because if something's not working, we can react in real time. Mm. But if you're doing exports, if you're doing like Vimeo links or something, just start sending stuff out. Start sending stills on iMessage. Do whatever. Just try to get as much feedback as possible. Because yeah. that's also very important. You know, people are like making a movie. They're putting mm. themselves into it. Mm. It's very important that uh, not only that you call the movie, but that they feel heard and that they feel, yeah. you know, that they feel like they're in charge. That they, that they, you know, they're controlling the process. That's very true, yeah. You so know. don't be too precious about what you're signing out. Just like send it out and be like, this is a work in progress, basically. Yeah. All the time, yeah. all the time, yeah. I, uh, I, you know, the still I will send out, mm. like if I, if I send out a still, it'll be as perfect as possible. Mm. But the link, I'll just be like, you know, we're still working. Mm. This is just for you to start getting used to seeing it in motion. Mm. Because a lot of times I think people will also get in their head about a still, yeah. you know? And again, like that problem that I had where you know, sometimes you'll get some, some notes in where it has something to do with sizing or had something to do with something that's not my job, you know. Uh, sometimes people will get bogged down in film grain, you know, mm -hmm. like where you send a still and they're like, is it too grainy? Should we add some more grain? And, you know, you've got to send out a Vimeo link because, A, uh, 
how much of this grain is going to make it through web compression? Yeah. Uh, B, does it even matter? Mm. You know, like when you watch it in, in motion, like grain is great, but like that is, you know, that, you know, there's like a hierarchy of needs that yeah. a grades has, and the grain is just the tippy top. Like if everything else is perfect, let's talk about grain structure. Let's talk mm. about noise, dust. You know, like do you want a plate? Do you want a, a film emulator? Do you, you know, like, but. If your movie's not colored, let's just work on. Yeah. Let's work on some other stuff, you know. See, like layers that you're building up. Yeah. 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 What What would you say is a good way to transition from from doing the free from doing the free work and the low paid work into like getting more and more like so you can live off live off the craft? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, there is the advice is probably not uh, like easy to hear, but like for a long time I wasn't making a lot of money. I was learning my craft. You know, don't be afraid to work for a little bit. Um, you know, increase your rates gradually. Mm -hmm. Just know that this business is all about uh, your reputation. It's all about your quality of work. You know, as a freelancer, I don't really have the luxury to phone it in uh, virtually ever because the people I work with, you know, I, I see them down the street. It's a very small community. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I would say the colorists that I know that are doing really well, be prepared to work a lot. Mm. Be prepared to work a lot for a long time. And be prepared to, um, you know, really prioritize relationships over everything else. That's what's worked for me. Yeah. I know other colorists where, you know, they don't have a lot of repeat clients. Um, you know, they might, you know, they might go through a, a, a number of people a year. Okay. Um, but I have... You know, a lot of repeat clients. I try to do well by them, and um, yeah, I, I I would just say that even at this level that I'm at, which is you know I'm not you know I'm not tall pool or anything, but you know every every month or so there are projects I lose money on all mm -hmm. the time, you know, and I do that because um, one, it's always good to be working, you know, work like no matter what you do. Yeah, like I'm extremely busy right now, yeah. but even like back then, like just. Always be working. Always be coloring. You know, don't take like big breaks for whatever reason. And then um, it's just good to keep up the relationships. You know, because you know someone will make a movie and they're very into it. But you know, just try to make it work. You know, because uh, I think I sort of just have a philosophy like every movie deserves to be colored. You know, but um, you never know um, what's going to happen in the future or or how a relationship will pan out. So just always put your best foot forward, you know.